And we are live. Welcome back to another episode of the Mecca of Banter podcast. I'm not even going to do my sound effect today because as you can see, guys, I am drinking wine. Um, <laughs> my total wine membership has seen a drastic increase in the <laughs> performance of Chelsea of lately. Um, but I don't want to make this podcast any more depressing than it needs to be. Um, how are we doing, boys? Let's clock in. I'm going to start over here with Hoover. Maybe you can bring a smile or some brightness to this pod. <laughs> hey, man, we're having fun. I tell you what, I picked the single worst weekend to go camping without uh, phone service <laughs> as a Spurs fan before they, you know, uh, 2 1 late oh, stoppage time winners. Yeah, I mean, that was maybe the most electric soccer game ever, and I didn't see any of it. But uh, <laughs> no, it was fantastic. We're we're flying right now. I'm happy to be here. Let's chat city and everyone else too. Yeah, obviously Hoover's gonna pass it on over to Henry. Uh, Henry maybe ben, yeah. <laughs> my bad. Uh, That's my what's fault. Up, um first off, it's great to see you all after uh not being able to make last pod and then the pod before that going into the abyss and not not being here. It's great to see all of you. And let me tell you, it is a great week to be a Manchester United fan. Um, you know, every single week that I uh, think of being a Manchester United fan, I am just eternally grateful that I'm not a Chelsea fan. So uh, it's a great week to be a Manchester United fan. Uh, we have a lot to dig into this this episode and this week of games uh i have some thoughts on uh, united's performance obviously some thoughts uh to city as well and uh, i will give a shout out real quick to uh hannah and anna on my indoor soccer team as they have now aff affectionately coined our group chat between the three of us as the mecca of slander with a picture of jared stroud as our nice, group fellow. so nice. uh, big shout out to the two of you and uh we're here we're out here yeah, um, and we will gladly continue to be United's scapegoat for how shit they're performing. <laughs> but uh, we'll move on from Henry, and uh, why don't you clock in, Winks? What's up, boys? Winks here at LCW21 on Twitter. Another great weekend for us, still undefeated in the Prem. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing but smiles over here. Finally, finally beat Everton at Goodison Park for the first time in six years, I think it's been. Um which is crazy in, in its own. I feel like Everton away has been our kryptonite the last several years, as I mentioned. So happy to finally jump that hurdle and in a, in a convincing and dominating way. So excited to dive into that. And equally so to see you all on here, as Henry said. So let's get I know that you. I know that you said like in the in the group chat that Everton has been your bogey team, but that is an insane stat. Yeah, that I know that. Six, six years or six times, whatever, that you haven't won at Goodison Park. Like, I think that that is beyond me especially for like how bad Everton have been and like you all have been great the last like two seasons but even years before that you were at least like competent when they weren't or better on paper to them yeah, so yeah know, some, something about something about certain teams away in yeah. the stadium the, the atmosphere you know we we talked about it and we'll talk about it a little bit more later but I I still remember last year when we played them away I think it was in February um I was I was staying at my buddy's house for the Mitre Cup, this indoor tournament that was in town that weekend, and I'm like watching it on my phone, like laying on my buddy's couch where I slept the night before, and just like so painful. But you could hear the crowd chanting even almost louder than the announcers were were talking over over the microphone. So it's a wild place to play, and yeah, nonetheless excited that we finally jumped that. Hey, you're still getting three points, and that's something I haven't felt in a little bit, so we move. But as you guys said, I'm happy to see all of you, and like Henry said um, before, we have a jam-packed episode um, for you guys. We're going to have, of course, our weekly um, review of the games this weekend. We're going to talk about St. Louis City's performance, and then also talk about um, the Champions League uh, groups and select who we think is going to advance from those. So... Boys, let's dive right into it with our weekly recap. Um, from the weekend, um, the first game, uh, obviously we don't have any representation from Liverpool, um, but <laughs> hey, they score another three points. Um, I bet Butchie is pretty happy. 
Um, they have a 3-1 win over Wolverhampton Wanderers. I don't know if you guys want to go into detail about it. Um, I will say I thought it was interesting Nunez not starting. Um, I think Jota and Gakpo, like, I, I find that pretty interesting that everyone's been raving about the performances of Nunez late, and yet he still isn't seeing the starting um, nod. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. He did come on um, in the 56. Um, I didn't, of course, get to watch this game that much. Um, but yeah, 3-1 win for Wolves. I think the the only thing that I'll say about it is it feels like it feels like after last season, Darwin Nunez, like obviously going through the struggles that he went through and the performance, I feel like Klopp is doing what like Potter should have done with Havertz and maybe Arteta should do with Havertz this year, where like obviously there was a player really struggling for form. And I mean, actually, I'll, I'll give a, a shout out to Big Ange as well with Richarlison. We can talk about that too. But like, I, I think that like, Darwin Nunez, I agree. Like when he wasn't starting games early in the season, I was like, that's a little odd. But I think he's honestly just like protecting him a little bit, getting the monkey off his back and like letting him score goals and do it from the bench so that when he gets his full 90s, like he'll be confident in front of goal again. Um, so I don't know. May, maybe that's something to Klopp's credit that, you know, he's been doing it longer, obviously, than Potter has or, or longer than Arteta has. Maybe that's just something up his sleeve that he says, like, after a year of performing the way he did, maybe we bring him off the bench. It really, uh, gives me a reason not to. So I don't know. I I think that that's the one thing I can say about them. Yeah, I agree. And to be fair, we don't have to touch on them that much at all because we don't have any representation for them. So we can just move on (laughs) right past them. They had a win. Who cares? All righty. The next scoreline I do want to bring up, and boy, does it feel good to say. Um, It is three Brighton, one Manchester United. Um, Henry, I'm shocked you don't have a glass of wine next to you as well. Um, How are we feeling after that result? Uh, dude, I mean, so Brighton, they're just, they're good, bro. They're They're really good. Yeah, the truth. Uh, We got, uh, honestly, it was, it was a really embarrassing loss, to be honest with you. Like the first 20 minutes, I mean, I, I don't know if you all even watched the game, but the first 20 minutes, like, we looked really good, to be honest. Like, we we were electric. Some of our, like, possessions, like, going forward had, like, beautiful back-to-front, uh, you know, moves. Rashford took a couple of guys on in the first 20 minutes that you were like, whoa, there are – those are the five-star skills. That's what that is, like, just, like, really, really doing it. Hoyland looked – looked electric like i mean first 20 minutes i was like damn i think i even texted dobes like during the first 20 minutes being like okay we showed up like this is this is sick and brighton honestly looked like they didn't know what hit him um and then that was like as good as it got it got significantly worse throughout the game um you know we we got outplayed in every aspect of the game that ends our i don't know i think it's like 30 something matches unbeaten at home um that ends that streak, which is unfortunate, but uh, there, some of the more concerning things that we saw was overall, it seemed like there was like a really big lack of effort from a lot of the guys. And I'll be like the first one, like, obviously you all know how much I love Marcus Rashford and how much I talk about him at nauseum. Like there were, I mean, I'm sure you all have seen like the two minute compilation of all of Rashford's lack of pressing during the game. Um, we were here a year ago, literally a year ago, we were sitting on this podcast talking about how like Ronaldo needed to get out of the club because he doesn't have the legs for a 10 hog system. He's not pressing. He's not doing his job defensively. And then you see like a 10 year younger Marcus Rashford not doing it. Like, it's just really frustrating to see that. And, you know, Messi gets a pass because Messi's messy. But like, if you're not doing what Messi does on the offensive side of the ball, like you're not, that guy to where you just can't be working hard and i just can't quite figure out like why ten hog just gives rashford a like a a pass to not press to not work defensively there were so many times that we could have turned the ball over if they just did something a little bit more than what they did so that was embarrassing that was like a really embarrassing uh embarrassing you know display and um Obviously, the Mecca has been blowing up about Manchester United's performance, and we've gotten some wild takes from some of the guys. Um, But there was something good that came out of uh, the week. Two things. Um, One, Hoyland got pulled off in about the 60th minute, and, like, all of Old Trafford booed, meaning 
they don't want that guy off the field. Like it has been so long since we've had a striker that like the fans are way behind and granted he's played two games or I think in total he's played like, you know, 80 minutes, but you know, they booed Ten Hag's decision to take him off the field, which shows that there's like backing up a striker. And then second thing, um, that's the wasn't he injured. Like I, no. Oh, he like wasn't prior. Yeah. yeah. I, I thought yeah. 70 minutes or 65 minutes. Like, I mean, I, I understand being upset of him coming off the field, but sure. You got to think of the future there. Yeah, and and that might be what it was. Like, I don't know if Ten Hag's come out and and said something about it, but, like, you have to think, just like you said, that that was probably what it was. So that was number one. Number two is all of Brighton's content over the last, like, two days. It has been, if you haven't, like, looked up Brighton's Twitter account, it's been fucking outrageous, like, what what they've done um, because they can. And so I think that that's great for the internet. And uh, hurts just a little bit when I look at it. So um, it wasn't good. And I want to say that Bayern Munich's going to be better mid mid uh, midweek. But I don't know. Wamba Saka's apparently hurt for weeks, and that joins our injury list. And uh, you know, we're out here. I just, I really, honestly, only have one question for you, and it really huh? pains me that Dobes isn't here to answer it as well. But um, when is panic mode for you guys? <laughs> um there's some context for, here for those asked the same question to yeah. nick what week one yeah, yeah. so yeah. this is where i think i think this is where we differ my panic mode truthfully has nothing to do with ten hog at all like my my panic mode is the same panic mode that I had, you know, last season, which is the Glazers, the ownership. So about a year ago, maybe 11 months ago, they came out and said that Manchester United is up for sale. We're going to get new ownership. And if you are, you know, aware of the Manchester United fan base, that's what we've wanted for years and years and years and years. We've wanted the Glazers out of the club. They've like bled the club dry they're the worst owners in sports they're such bad owners that the premier league made a rule to not do what the glazers did when buying a club like that is how horrendously uh they have owned the club and so ten hog over the last couple transfer windows has gone out and said hey these are my top three targets of the window they haven't signed a single one not a single one so they've spent a ton of money on players that might have been his second or third choice but not the guys that he's wanted. So he hasn't really been backed at all. I do feel, I think Ten Hag signed a three-year deal um, going into last year. So, you know, he's on year two of his three-year deal. I genuinely feel that if the club's not sold by the summer, I think that next year he'll just walk away from the club. I think that, like, he won't sign any extensions. He won't do anything. And there lies the problem over the last, like, several managers. Like, not saying that the solve was Mourinho or the solve was Van Hall or the solve was Solskjaer. Like that wasn't it, but we see the same pattern as like a manager comes in year one, gets a result like, and they get backed in their first transfer window. And then in the second window, they don't get any backing whatsoever. And then they get sacked. Like it's just how the cycle goes at Manchester United. So my panic mode has nothing to do with Ten Hag. Like, I can rationalize, like, looking at the signings in, the the lack of signings out, the lack of signings in. Like, there's this statistic that over half of the signings that Ten Hag has made in his, like, tenure have either been loans or free transfers because, like, the Glazers won't, like, get the people that he wants. And so my panic mode has nothing to do with Ten Hag. It has everything to do with the Glazers. And if we get towards the, like, the end of the season, and regardless of where we are in the table, if the Glazers are having, like, no sign of leaving, that's when I will be like, okay, we might we might have one more year of Ten Hag, and then we're just going to get the next person, and the next thing's going to happen. It's, like, it's really dark days when you think about, like, the Glazer ownership. I, sound, I know a couple of owners that sound kind of like that. <laughs> I think I've heard this story before. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, dude, the thing, it's like, where, but like, okay, okay, you're right. And I think I agree with you on the Ten Hog thing. And I think that's not someone you want to lose. And I, I see him as a good manager. Um, but at some point, you're, you, we can rationalize. And we've talked about transfers and we've talked how this goes. But there's there's got to be a right here, right now attitude yeah. towards playing the game in the league every week totally. and, and having champions league. And I, I didn't watch the full game and I saw the highlights, but like 
Dude, McTominay not tracking on it's the first the goal, starting lineup, and the, yeah. like some of these guys. And you know, I don't, I don't know tactically where you want to get started with that. But I think there's got to be some sort of like, like pressure on the players to do something too, and that has to come from the manager. Yeah, well, that's what I want. Like, I want that. I want that pressure on the players to go and perform and. Like, I was texting Dobes today. I was like, I don't want to get into a Nick Hayflinger uh, soapbox of how injury-prone our team is right now. Uh, but, like, we genuinely have – we do have some injuries. And, like, it just, like it keeps happening. So, like, McTominay playing that, like, hybrid right midfield, right wing position on Saturday, like, never in a million years does that make any sense. But quite genuinely, our players are either injured or getting arrested. So, like, we don't have this, like, yeah. of people coming in. Like – you even think about like our signings that we made going into this season, like Amrabat injured, Hoyland was injured for those like first couple of games, Mounts injured already. Like there's just areas of the field where it's like, we just haven't really even seen like our full team and our full potential. So like, I would love to say who that like you're spot on of like, I want that pressure on the players, but like right now they're like, okay, so like, what are you going to do? Put in like a U17 player, like in my position, like quite genuinely we don't have the competition in the squad to like do that and i think again like i'm not even trying to like divert attention but that goes back to like lack of investment lack of backing and like lack of depth in the team so like you guys you guys did put in a 17 year old to be fair and he did score so like yeah that was exactly exactly. that was sick it was a great goal you look at like in you know, I, I look at like Arteta and when he came in a couple of years ago, like, and of course we saw the, we saw the finishes in the table, like, you know, eight, eighth, fifth, and then finished second. But like of w- when Arteta came in, there's two players on that Arsenal squad from when Arteta came in too, like only two. And so like the clear out that has happened in Arsenal over the last couple of years, same thing when Pep, when Pep came in, there's like very few, if any at all players that have been left from that, like takeover. It is a process. My concern is where like the process is not happening behind closed doors of like our transfer business, our exits, our incomings. So like, regardless of what we see on the field, we're capped at like what we do in the transfer market and specifically what we don't do in the transfer market. So like, I agree with you, Hoob. I want pressure on the players too. Like I'm sitting there on my couch being like, for the love of God, just like, yeah, throw Hannibal out there. I don't think that he's like Manchester United quality, but at least he'll go fucking tackle someone yeah. and we'll pull up from 25 yards and just shoot an outrageous shot. Yeah, like, that was ridiculous. Give me something. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's how I feel at the moment. I, my only other point here is that we have to talk about Brighton and Deserby because Holy also shit. they balled yeah, <laughs> like with, they, like, with their backup 11 with, it's with like, genuinely nobody out. I mean, Matoma, um, you know, a couple of those guys, Tyreek Lamptey had a great game, yeah. but like that Pascal gross goal the second goal was actually insane it's being circulated on you know football tactics twitter be for for the how the build-up went and it was like surgical and there's for sure a couple parts where you can see that you know a united player probably should have pressed but there it was surgical it was so good i love watching brighton play i repeat how much i love deserby (laughs) um and i think i i agree jp said something in the chat today that I was like, I hope he stays at Brighton. I would love to see them play high-level football for an extended period of time and continue to run a club with this recruitment that they've done. Like, Ten Hag had some BS interview or BS, you know, quote after. And I think he was just not thinking the correct way. But, like, the amount of money that Brighton spent on the 11 that beat United was 16 million pounds. <laughs> yeah. They were all free loans or, like, 2 million transfer. So I, it's just insane that what they keep doing and, you know, sometimes they get thumped, which I find to be random, but uh, I hope they continue. And, and if it wasn't for how your guys' performance looked, I'd be, I, you know, you'd say, look, Brighton's great. Like there's no way around it. You move on. But I think it was a two-sided coin for sure. Yeah, that's fair. It's all fair. Sounds like such a great week to be a United fan, as Henry said in the beginning of the podcast. Um, moving on to some... It's, it's a great week to be a Manchester United for. It's Monday and it's not Saturday, you know? That's uh, all I'm saying. I'm taking the Bayern money line. I don't know if that's going to be. I'm just letting you know that. <laughs> in the past, but moving on to someone who actually did get three points this weekend. 
Um, Tottenham Hotspurs, two. Sheffield United, one. Hoover, I know you said that you were uh, cell serviceless um, while you were camping, but boy, did you miss an exciting thriller as we had two goals um, in extra time in the 98th in the 100th minute um, of this <laughs> game for uh, Tottenham to come back with a 2-1 thriller. thriller. Let's um, get your thoughts on it. The, vi- the vibes are high, for sure. We're Vibes FC right now. Um, <laughs> I don't even know really where to start. It's against Sheffield. I keep, you know, every week I, I like to throw that out early and just say it's not been the craziest stretch of run of, of games here. Um, nonetheless, Sheffield three played. Three points is three points. Hoover. Three points is three points. Yeah. And Sheffield played the shit out of a championship level quality match. And they did it really well, to be fair. Yeah. So um, they were happy going home 0-0. Zero, zero. They were, they, they got a goal on a, a you know, bounced throw in off a head ball, to be fair, really nice finish in the 78th. I am a huge proponent of the throw in set piece. I don't know why you don't get the ball as close to the box as you can every time, but yeah. um, you know, that's how they play. That's fine. And then it was a, and then it was a time suck fest, hence the 12 minutes of added time. So uh, the ref wasn't great. Um, there were a lot of factors, I think, slided against uh, coming out of there with three points. But at the end of the day, dude, you saw you, you saw the opposite of a United performance, and no no slight, but just like it it hit a point when they're like, we gotta go, like we have to go, we have to go, we have to go. There was urgency. They didn't they didn't overplay. They didn't play themselves out of the game. They weren't making rash decisions. They were just playing their game, and it it you know resulted in a Richie header that was just like genuine redemption <laughs> like like genuine redemption you want to sign yourself back up for the for the starting 11 you just get your head on the box on in corners like that's what it is and he does that really well so that was electric they played through matters and to be fair Hjoiberg has been a, a serviceable uh, player off the bench in the last few matches and he slipped you know another pass to matters and and he found um Richie and Richie found Kulisevsky in the middle and it was a beautiful little Build up and written and Kulisevsky put it away. But um, yeah, you know, I don't even know what else there is to say. Like, uh, I think Christian Romero is incredible. Uh, he has one foul this year, I think is what I saw. I may be completely making that up, but he's, you know, he seems like he's kind of backed off of being the savage defender that he's kind of known to be and way more aware of the, the game and position and, and where he needs to play. Um, so that's something super cool to see that his growth is is coming in, and I think he's going to be a top player. But Ange's Ange's the Ange's the focal point. He comes yeah, off. Gotta talk about Ange, bro. He comes off the field and like you know, not even to to start with uh, his conversation about mental health in the the pregame presser before the game even started. Richie had you know media in in uh, Brazil basically confirmed that he'd had personal issues in his in his you know personal life outside of football could have been contributing to his play and you know how his performances had been and Ange had a you know just the most real adult man not football manager of Tottenham High. it was a, it was a Ted Lasso esque moment to me. Like he said, he just, you know, drops the football thing. He's like, we're people too. He's like, you have to think about like where some of these kids come from. He always talks about, he's like, at some point, I'm just a guider of young men. You know, it it feels like the best college coach or the best high school coach you ever had. Like that's, that's what he's doing. And I think that's working for the group of guys that he has in the locker room right now. And it's, it's a hundred percent reflected on the field. So He's just a godsend in my eyes and like, you know, not the high profile manager that we thought we might get. Um, but the w- way that he fits with Sonny as the captain, I, I'm like gushing over here. The guy's just genuinely a really good dude. And I think a lot of people outside of Tottenham are very even like, I like watching this guy. I like hearing him. He's, you know, good. He's funny. He's real. He's kind of just a human. Um, yeah, it's insane. I'm obsessed with it. Tottenham are turning into like must must watch football week yep. in and week out, and like, all I mean to your point, it's like the style of play, it's the fight, and it's also the pre and post match. Like, there ha- it's been a while since I've like really been tuned into like another team's like pre match, post match. Like, I mean, 
like I send you TikToks all the time of like stuff that I see of Ange talking. And I'm like, dude, like that is the guy. Like I think a Ted Lasso moment's like a really great way of describing it. But like I care so much about like people outside of the game. Yeah. Yeah. And he's just out there on the world's biggest stage being like, yeah, let's set the football thing aside and let's just talk. And I'm like, that's cool. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And and it's hard not to like guys like that. Like we have this conversation and there's a, a photo at London Fashion Week with, with Sun next to Saka. And I truthfully, there's a lot of people that are like, you know, football's gone soft. Like, no, they're getting paid exorbitant amount of money to be there. They might as well be cordial. And like, it, I thought that was nice. That It, know, it is kind of weird one week before North London people. Derby. For sure. For sure thought that was odd. And it definitely was just a situational <laughs> but- thing. It is cool, because, yeah, because like you said, they're two of the most likable guys in the game right now, or in the Premier could, League at least. You can tell how awkward they look next to each other, too, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, I, I couldn't agree more with Henry. I think Spurs are must-watch football right now. I think Ange is kind of your focal point, like you were saying, Hoove. Um, the other team that I wanted to mention that got three points this weekend um, was Manchester City. Um, they had a three-one win over <laughs> Lucas over West Ham. Yeah, calm yourself there, man. Um, Holland scored another goal. I thought it was interesting. I was like looking up, and I was expecting to see that he had three goals this game, but no, he only had one. Oh man, pity him with only one goal. Um, besides Not gonna that, win Bondor though. Yeah, you, you, you don't have to do that now. Um, but. Besides that, Newcastle with the 1-0 win over Brentford. And then, obviously, the other game um, on Sunday was Chelsea versus Bournemouth. Um, a 0-0 draw. He's, he's I told you, Winks, I was going times. in order. I, I don't under, I'm confused why you're confused. 0-0 um, zero, zero draw. Um, no point – or one point for um, Chelsea Blues. Um, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I watched maybe 80 minutes – um, of this game and immediately turned it off because I was bored. Um, right now, the style of play that we're playing is not fun to watch. Um, I sound like a broken record at this point. Yeah, you do. And I think uh, <laughs> I'm hoping we don't get relegated. Um, and I don't know if you guys had any questions or anything you wanted to ask about Chelsea, but that's all I really had. I mean, Mauricio Pochettino, he yeah, dude. Take you know. Okay, I, one, one thing. I, you can go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I want to talk so much shit on Chelsea, and they got exactly one more point than Manchester United this week. So I uh, can't really say too much. But um, one, Raheem Sterling looks like the truth. We said it last pod, but like, dude, like. He first looks half. like the truth in our boring system that we play. But the thing is, is like first half, that man is turning, taking guys on. He's driving to the goal line. He's doing stuff like it's just not fully coming together. But, you know, so I'll give flowers there. Showers to the attacking third. I don't know what it is, but like you all, you all have some movements of play in your defensive third, in the middle third that I'm like, world class like times that i'm convinced that enzo fernandez is the best midfielder in the league and i'm like good for him he's doing it and then you all like cross the offensive third threshold and it's like you just everything slows to, down every it's just like you forget how to play the game like there are t- there's like like sh- like uh there's one moment of the game where like connor gallagher had the opportunity to like lay it off and just like a simple like three to five yard pass or whatever and just plays the ball behind the guy and just like can't connect a simple pass in the final third so like i actually don't have any questions i i um i feel like we have talked about this at nauseam already this season and last season but like i i mean for the sake of you all i hope that in kunku coming coming back whenever he does changes the attack a little bit because in the preseason, you all were balling. So, um, yeah, I don't get it. Yeah, um, Mudrick uh, thought he did not look good at all. Terrible. Um, yeah, I think there was – he literally looked like there was moments where he literally turned the ball over with no one around him, and he reminded me of Stroud. Um, so that's yeah. Never oh, yeah. great. That's never a great feeling at all for a $100 million <laughs> signing. Um, I will say – the only thing that I'm hoping is uh, that we actually let Pochettino have a little bit of time. Um, obviously, 
Um, that is something that Chelsea has not done um, in the past two years with our five different managers. So I'm actually hoping um, that we don't just Ugh. fall in a vicious cycle of hiring. That's another managers. gross statistic. So, yeah, um, I, I read that statistic that Tuchel was fired, was it two years ago or last year, a couple of weeks ago? And he said there's been four managers since Tuchel. That's Dude. insane. Yeah, that's disgusting. Dude. Yeah, Dude. you're right. He and Conte had that little handshake and then it was over. Yeah. and It was literally a year ago. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, I, I'm hoping that wow. we, like, yes, I it's not good right now. Like, no way am I happy. But, like, I'm I'm not saying that Poach is the guy, but, like, give him time to prove himself that he is the guy. Um, we have a bunch of youngsters. Um, I hate that I said this earlier in literally the Mecca group message. I think we have a bunch of young guys with a lot of money price tags on their head and they're having to perform now and there's a lot of pressure and it's getting to them. Um, I'm going to be honest. You can see, I, I, I think um, they don't know what to do in the attacking third. They're kind of looking at each other to do something. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really want to talk <laughs> much more besides that. All right. Winks, we can finally talk about your 1-0 Arsenal victory over Everton. Um, as we alluded before, obviously Everton has had your number for the past couple of years. So um, I bet these three points felt, felt pretty good. Um, what were your takes on the game? It did, man. And as Henry kind of said earlier, like Everton's not good. So it, it's weird that like beating a team that isn't good feels this good but like I said earlier knowing the history between our clubs the last six years um it, it felt especially good and I think was exactly what we needed in terms of again jumping this hurdle heading into such a big week with uh PSV on Wednesday and then the North London Derby on Sunday um Sunday Sunday we dominated though and similarly to how Henry said Brighton dominated every aspect of that game we dominated every aspect of ours. Um, glad, glad, very glad Arteta started Vieira uh, in the midfield this game. I thought he played well, and hopefully, he he mentioned it a little bit or got asked a, about it a little bit in his post game interview. But hopefully, this is a look into Kai playing a similar role to what Darwin is doing at Liverpool, and Arteta just kind of easing him into the team rather than dropping him in the starting 11 and expecting him to excel because watching him at Chelsea the last couple of years, we know that that's just not who he is. Um, Vieira did miss a few good opportunities though. Uh, he missed frame and that was very Kai esque, but he was in better positions and a few of his shots that, that would have gone on net were, were blocked by defenders. So I think overall an upgrade from what we've seen Kai recently um, in that position. And he just looks more comfortable too in, in that role um, on the left in the midfield. So, so that, that was a positive. Uh, Martinelli had a goal taken back. I, I don't know if you guys, what did you guys watch any of the Arsenal game? Nope. Okay. That's all right. No. Um, there, there, there was one like deflection ball f off of off of one of our players that went kind of like in between the two Everton center backs and Nketiah came from being like a foot off less than a foot off sides headed it back to our midfielder who sent Martinelli through and he scored that goal got called back and then another goal of ours that got that didn't get called again we still don't know what a handball is in this league or in any league yeah, that's um, true. But if, I don't know if you guys saw that highlight either, but Zinchenko took a shot from outside the 18 and it hit Tarkowski uh, in like the forearm. And it didn't get called after getting looked at in VAR. Um, hmm. And in my opinion, it was the right call. I just still, like if, if I was a VAR official, if I was a ref and saw how how his arm was placed against his body, I wouldn't have called it a handball either. But it's unfortunate uh, in a similar way because we've seen you know, worse calls get called a penalty. So I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like bitch anymore about that because I, I agree with what the call was. I just still think it's unfortunate at the lack of the game's ability to provide a full understanding for what a handball is and what's not. That first goal was suspect too, wasn't it? I, I like, I truthfully didn't see a ton of it, but I saw some discourse on, on Twitter. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it, it was literally, uh, Nketiah was like, 
late well not late tracking back because the ball was being pretty was being played pretty stagnantly in the midfield and then it just took like a weird bounce off of an, an attempted like clearance or through ball or something and just got bounced like right to him and so he tried to get on side and like the on the the offside line was literally like less than a foot it was like his back foot that was like dragging or like as he was taking a step it was like less than a foot so again i'm, I'm not gonna bitch about that because that was also kind of a if it if he would have been on side, it would have been a very lucky deflection in our favor that was just kind of kind of like an like an up back through ball, and it was a great finish for Martinelli, but unfortunate there too. So very easily could have been three zero, maybe even more if we had scored those two goals earlier in the game and had a bit more more momentum. But unfortunately, Martinelli went down with a muscle injury, and he'll be out on Wednesday against PSV. Uh, everything I've read today doesn't say anything about. Uh, him missing Sunday, which will be good because I think that he's a super important piece to our squad going forward. Him and Saka on the wings, um, but we broke we broke the curse with Arteta's bargain buy in Leandro Trossard scoring in the 85th minute um, off off the post and in with his left foot. It was I don't I don't know if you guys saw that either. I saw that. It was a great but, finish. He's a player, dude. And incredible finish, but what a what a sequence of passes. I think it was like six pass sequence off of a short corner kick and just breaking lines. And then Saka kind of does like a, like a cutback cross to him and Trissard takes it off the bounce with his left foot off the ground and, uh, and put it post in. So that was, nice. that was great. But Jordan Pickford also had a great game. So I don't want to knock, um, you know, anything. I thought that outside of, outside of Jordan Pickford, it could have been a lot worse. Um, but I don't think Everton looked particularly dangerous on goal at any point for me. Their shots on goals weren't really threatening, but Rhea looked very calm all the way around, a pretty easy clean sheet for his debut, but did really well with his feet, which was a positive for me, um, looked really calm. And so I could definitely see him as much as I didn't want to say, because I didn't think, you know, if we had brought in a keeper, Prior to Ray, I I wasn't ever predicting it would be somebody that would be taking his spot, but I could really see him eventually at some point in the season um, taking that starting role. And uh, and yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I see that Arteta came out and and said like something to the extent of like uh, keepers don't really get substituted for yeah. anything other than injuries, but he's like debating playing with the idea of making like a goalkeeper substitution because different games call for different strategies and different things. Like different people are good at different things, i.e. what you just mentioned, like David Ray is like very good with his feet. And if like a team is letting Arsenal have all the possession and we need to play a couple like long balls or whatever, he might make a substitution for Ramsdale in the middle of the game, which I think would be... That would be electric. And I think would also change the game a lot. Like I I think that if, if he... I don't think it would don't, at all. You don't you don't you don't think that other teams would consider doing that? No. I don't know, man. No. I don't know. I think it's wild. I, I, I think I think teams will continue to like buy goalkeepers like Rhea yeah. that can play with their feet, but they will be the starting goalkeeper. Yes. And then like in a couple of years. They're not gonna years, waste the sub. They're not gonna it's waste the sub. It's an irresponsible long. use of substitutions. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and so like, you know. For sure, he can try that, and I thought it was a super interesting take because I was like, "That is literally something I've never thought about before." But like, I saw some like Arsenal discourse on our fucking timeline of of people being like, "Arteta is going to change the future of football," and I was like, yeah. "It's not." <laughs> like, he's just kind of like JP. I'm gonna say, yeah. it's uh, Arsenal fan there. I, I I don't I, we don't need to stay on this any too much longer, but uh, I I find Arteta to be not super likable. Um, personally, that may just be me. I find he's like the Ange antithesis. Like, he's like, we go, we play, we play this style of game and we break the team down. And Ange is like, I don't know, mate. But, yeah, we'll find what? out. <laughs> uh, but How does that you know, make him not likable if he's, if he's got a plan and isn't just like, yeah, fuck it, we'll just go play? I don't know. Well, I've definitely, I've, I've taken a whole different approach to how I view football because of this yeah, Ames guy. Right. So, dude, it's like uh, you went to Jamaica. You're a new man. Like, I was gonna say, thing is like just like, like chill and nice and I don't easy. Know. I don't know, he went on ayahuasca and is now seen the light. Yeah, literally. Ayahuasca uh, advocate over here. Um, <laughs> he but, sees no, the world, I, no, I don't think manager or you know, Ted is a bad manager. I think he's great. I, you know, whatever they've done really well. He's definitely transformed it. But like, 
I don't know, just some of the things he says in interviews, the way he presents himself, I, you know, in the dressing room, things got to be different. But it's just, I, I just, I don't know. That's maybe just me, and maybe that's personal bias, but who knows? <laughs> Has nothing to do with the game on Sunday, but fuck that guy. No, no, <laughs> not even worried. <laughs> I was going to say that wraps up our weekly recap of this past week's games. But as Henry alluded to, the upcoming game this weekend is the North London Derby Arsenal versus Tottenham. Um, So that'll be a good one. Um, Moving on to the next part of the podcast where we talk about a team that we all can agree on. Finally, um, St. Louis City. Um, They were in Houston this weekend and they had a 1-1 draw. Um, I will say one thing, and I'll start it off as this. I'll only say it once. We saw Stroud in the starting lineup, which greatly pissed me off. Um, I watched <laughs> him make five backward passes and stop three of our own counterattacks. I will say one thing. He was then subbed. So Carnell is finally Thank God. He finally listened to the pod last week. One of the earliest he's ever been subbed after starting, too. Carnell was definitely listening to the Mecca. Yeah. But he was finally subbed. And guess what? We scored a goal. Huh. It's crazy how that happens. Yeah. So, obviously, want to get your boys' take on what was a 1-1 draw to Houston. My overall take is I have two thoughts. Number one, Parker can't play next to Nilsson. I... Was I, I was I, I shit you not, and this is gonna sound so fucking annoying of me, but like I was in the middle. I was I was watching it with Paige and two of our friends. I was in the middle of explaining to them why Parker and Nilsson can't play together. One of the reasons is Parker's not a right sided center back; he's a left sided center back. The other reason is because like Nilsson defends like a European defends, and Parker doesn't know what he's doing. So like I was literally in the middle of explaining this, and when they got that break going into our half, and I saw Nilsson start to move, I. Was I was like, okay, so literally right here, watch what this happens, this happens, this happens. Nilsson slides over to like help our left back, like shield the guy. Parker's in no man's land. They play a one two around Parker, and Parker doesn't even move. I was in the middle of explaining this right when they scored the goal, and I was like, dude, this is like bare basics of defending one on one. It's ridiculous. So that's number one. Number two, and the part that's actually a little bit more concerning to me. Um, we can like sit here and we can still be like, Hey, like we're feeling good. We're still top of like our conference and that feels nice. Our regression since like the all-star break has been horrendous. And I think that's being masked a little bit because we still see the number one attached to our name, but like we are losing momentum at a rapid pace going into the most important part of the season. We need to peak at the right time. We, we have, you know, on a completely different side of the table, we have Inter Miami, who seems to continually just getting better and better. Of course, they suffered their first loss today or this weekend, but like we have not picked up good points. We've lost terrible points over the last several games. So I feel like we could very well be a team that goes into the playoffs ranked number one for our conference and get bounced first round because we don't have the momentum where we need it. So my my huge nervousness is that we're regressing incredibly fast and um it's not going to take much for us to get found out and uh i'm worried about it to be honest with you yeah i i like 100 percent agree and i didn't get to watch a ton of this game obviously but um it, it's it's definitely a momentum thing like you said um but it's not it's none of it's consistent it's been since the league's break and we've not really figured out the way and, you know, taken the good notes from the good games and have reverted them to how we want to, you know, continue to play. And I I right. worry that Carnell overthinks sometimes. Mm. I think that's what I get nervous of. And I think he overthinks matchups. And I think he overthinks, you know, games outside of the game that they're playing that week. And that is extremely – makes me super nervous um, because you're right. You just want to be firing all cylinders towards the end, finish on a high – you know, we, we have to win our last three home games. And yeah. the next one is this Wednesday against LAFC, who's second and good. So I'm afraid that if we get exposed on Wednesday, I am I, we could be on a slide. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And this as well. Yeah. I alluded to, you know, the Mecca of slander earlier, and I asked them for their thoughts on, on St. Louis City right now. And like their overall thought is like they're just bored. Like they're bored with the team. Like we're just not doing. 
really any of what we used to do. And granted, you could chalk that up to, again, teams figuring us out and we're just not as dynamic as we were when we first entered the league. But, like, it's a boring watch. The last couple of games have been Mm -hmm. boring uh, to watch, which is obviously not great. So, um, yeah, uh, a little bit of nervousness over here from the St. Louis lads. Absolutely. Um, And we don't have to harp on it too much. We're hoping that we can find form and provide a better performance on Wednesday. Um, But we are going to move right into our 10 minute slash five minute segment um, (laughs) on the Mecca of Banter podcast, where we are going to go through the Champions League groups. Um, We, of course, have six of us in the Mecca of Banter podcast. So we already went through um, and picked who we think is going to advance um, between all these groups. Um, so I just want Winks to take it over. He can go through those groups and we can talk about them a little bit. Yeah, for sure. So Champions League starts this week. Um, group A, in order, not of not of how we pick to finish, but Group A, we've got Bayern Munich, Manchester United, Copenhagen, and Galatasaray. And after we after we had talked last, we decided that Bayern Munich were going to win the group pretty pretty well. Um, United at the time were going to <laughs> to get second in the group and move on, and then Galatasaray would go to Europa League. Um, I, I'm assuming we're also on the same page there. I don't mm-hmm. think there's any way Copenhagen. Mm-hmm. Copenhagen. I'm not worried whoa, about Copenhagen. Whoa, I'm worried whoa, about Galatasaray. Whoa. We'll stick with, with the dogs for now, but with the dogs. <laughs> but you, know, you got to go to Turkey. So great. <laughs> you got to go to them to, down there. I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens there. But um, I'll speak. I, I'm confident. I I still think that United's going to pull it through. I, I still think you I guys really will do. Too. I, I still think I think the quality's there. Amarbot's coming back. We have Manu coming back soon. Like Mount's coming back soon. Bronze back soon. I think that I think we'll I think we'll get it done. I'm very interested for your game against Bayern, though. Yeah. I oh yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to be schlacking. Yep. <laughs> um. Nonetheless, Group B: Sevilla, Arsenal, PSV, and Lens. Um. We picked Arsenal to win the group, Sevilla to finish second, and PSV to go to Europa League. But I do remember per our conversation that we were very iffy on Sevilla, or I think we were split decision between Sevilla and PSV. Mm-hmm. Um, I think PSV could. I think PSV could do it. I watched two of their. I watched actually their away and uh, home legs against Rangers to get in, and I think they're pretty impressive. Yeah, uh, I I think that that head to head match is going to be one of the better mid table or mid group matchups yeah. across across the board here. Um, you know Sergio Ramos going to Sevilla. And then I know that we've got a bunch of studs on PSV as well, so I think that'll be a that'll be a barn burner of a game. Um, so we'll see what happens there. But I will say I'm also really interested to see um, the lineups that Arsenal comes out with the Champions League. Um, I feel For like sure. depth is really interesting, and I I know um, your lineups could be um, pretty different than normal um, when it comes to Champions League and Premier League. So I'm interested in how Arteta does. I'm not saying that's in a bad way. Like I just yeah no and and it could, but I think hopefully it's different because this is Champions League and not Europa League. Like um, Zinho's gonna have to probably start playing. Uh, Kai's gonna have to start playing a little <laughs> bit more. Like, Secret agents. Yeah. yeah, I mean with 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 Party still being out, you know who who knows what happens there, but. I like the lineup that we played on Sunday and would be happy um, if we started that way. But obviously with Trissard starting on the left in Martinelli's spot. Um, Group C, though, Real Madrid, Napoli, Braga, and Union Berlin. Uh, We had Madrid and Napoli at the top of the group and Union Berlin going to Europa League. However, I also remember in this group, a lot of us really wanted Union Berlin to to make it on to move on um, because they've been so fun to watch the last year. Uh, I guess we'll see what happens there. But I, I the yeah. only thing I wanted to say about this group is Real Madrid. Um, watching Jude Bell or, or Jude play right now is so fun. You mean the truth, the absolute yeah. truth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like man's been he's the man, and I'm so sad he's at Real Madrid. <laughs> he's insane. Nails, but uh, 
Group D. Inter Milan, Benfica, Salzburg, and Real Sociedad. Um, I think this is a pretty solid group all the way around, to be fair. Uh, but we selected Inter to move on at the top of the group, Benfica to move on as well, and Real Sociedad to go to Europa League. Yeah, yeah similar to what you're saying. Oh, sorry, who? No, you're good. This one's tight. Like, yeah. Real Sociedad's not messing around right now. Um, Benfica are always, like... They're like the last team that you want to play, to be honest, away. Um, and Salzburg always shows up and scores goals. Like yeah. they're, they're they're super fun to watch. But uh, I think the, the order that you read there is pretty fair. Um, but we shall see. Yeah. And to be fair, by no means do I think any of these teams are gonna like win the Champions League. But I think this group, like talent or like level wise, is very similar. So I think we're gonna be in for a lot of electric ga- electric games. Yeah. Um, and, like, I think this could be a good group to watch. Forgot to mention we get to watch uh, Brennan Aronson play in the Champions League. Yeah, oh, bro. Brennan, yeah, too. So that's super fun. Would love to see them do well. Yeah, big shouts. All right, Group E, we have Atletico Madrid, Feyenoord. Did I even pronounce that right? Yeah. Close. Feyenoord, Close enough. Close enough. Lazio, and Celtic. Um, we had Atletico and Feyenoord. Moving on, and Lazio going to Europa League. Um, I know that there was a little back and forth discussion here between Bayonud and Lazio on who was going to move on and who was going to Europa. Um, but and I think at the time I was one of the couple that said Lazio. But um, I don't know. Do you guys still feel good about about that choice? Yeah. Uh, yeah it'll be close. But it will be close. I'm fine with it. It'll yeah. be another one of those ones that we just mentioned that like. I think they're all going to be... Yeah, why? Some of these groups suck. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's weird. I feel like there's like two... Looking at looking at the graph here, it looks like there's two groups, in my opinion, that have maybe three. Uh, maybe it's more than I thought. But two to three groups that like are not good and have like a clear outlier. One that's just... We'll talk about it here in a second, the group of death. But the, the other three, I feel like, are, or the other four are very well... Um, balanced well balanced all the way around yeah but leading into the group of death group f we have psg borussia dortmund milan and newcastle this this was one that we argued hard on because i'm we really did i i don't think psg is going through and that is a real bold take yeah i mean we 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 all had milan ac milan uh with our boy cp leading the way and finishing at the top of the group and then we were between PSG and Newcastle to move on and or go to the Europa League. Um Dortmund obviously went very downhill after losing Jude. Um <laughs> you will not Dude. stand for Newcastle. <laughs> Absolutely not. They're gonna get throttled home and away every single place they go. There, I there's no way. Even there's against no Dortmund way, man. I, I don't I, need I, Dortmund maybe, but like we're we're talking about a ton of guys that have no like minimal Champions League experience. Lester, Eddie Howe, the league like they went to the Champions League the next year and made it like all the way to the quarterfinals because they just basically said fuck the league. We're we're only playing the Champions League. I don't know. It could be another situation. Lester had negative amounts of experience. All, I... of, these, all of these teams are in similar situations in their domestic leagues, and yeah, that's, that's kind a of true. And yeah. That's a fair league point. Is, yeah, the league is one of the best. So. That's a really fair point. I don't see it. I hope the the Gordies have their fun. Jordies, whatever they are, have their fun in Milan <laughs> because they look like they're having it. But I, I truly the think they get bounced. I think the Tune Army is going to get bounced a <laughs> lot of places. But, well, no, I digress. I digress. All right. <laughs> Group G, Manchester City, RB Leipzig, Krizvena Vizinevena, Ravenna, Red Star, Zedda, Red Star, and the Young Boys. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is kind of, this is one of those outlier groups. Then for me, yeah. Manchester City moving on, uh, very very easily. Leipzig finishing second, and Young Boys going to Europa League. I know Young Boys are another one of those teams similar to Union Berlin that we just like are all kind of rooting for and want to do well. Um, but I think Leipzig are too strong. Manchester City for sure, but they should all wipe the Red Stars. 
terrifying place to also go play, to be fair. I could imagine. Even just yeah. looking at their name, I could imagine their that, that stadium's probably filled with, with flares and Oh yeah. Might you might eventually a, be too smoky to to see the ball. You which walk would be through sick. A, a graffitied concrete tunnel under the stadium to walk in. Like it's terrifying. It's scary. <laughs> That's sick. Um all right. And then the last group, group H, we have Barcelona, Porto, Shakhtar, and Antwerp. We had Bar- and we, we had it in that order, Barcelona finishing at the top of the group, um, I think pretty easily. Yeah. Dow Felix Porto. getting a goal for them over the weekend. Oh, they, they, looked, they looked so good. Yeah. They looked so good this weekend against Betis, who is legit. They're not a, a rollover team, and they looked unreal. Yeah. Excited, right. excited to watch them now that they kind of got their they got their signings dialed in and everybody's starting to play well together. They're going to be a fun team to watch too. Yeah, um, Porto finishing second and Shakhtar going to to Europa League again this year. All right, that concludes so, it. So, yeah, that's the Mecca banter uh, Champions League group picks. Um, we'll have those obviously up on our social medias um, so you guys can uh, give us your feedback on how you guys think we did. And obviously we can check in throughout the Champions League um, season um, to see how we uh, selected. I will say, boys, it does suck um, being a Chelsea fan and not having uh, Champions League during the week. Um, it's <laughs> Facts. Been a little bit yeah. since that's happened Facts. to me. Um, so, yeah, that stings yeah. a little bit. Um, But yeah, that wraps it up for this episode of the Mecca of Banter podcast. As always, follow us on all of our social medias, um, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is, you name it. Um, You can find us on Spotify um, for all of our episodes. Um, But yeah, cheers, lads. Appreciate it. Cheers, fellas. Yeah, boys. I was going to go. Ooh.